I want to thank you for joining us today for our Tuesday Bible study. Guess what? We're starting a brand new book, the book of Hebrews. And let me tell you, this is a challenging book for us. And so let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless us today as we open up your word, in particular this book of Hebrews, and pray that you would open up your word to us that we might be touched and transformed by it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I will tell you what, the book of Hebrews is really a challenging book to read. And so what I've done for you is I've provided for you online a handout that goes with the book of Hebrews that you can read it hopefully for yourself in addition to reading it as part of our Bible study. The outline will kind of tell you uh, what the thought process is of the author of Hebrews and the direction that he's going to try to pull everything together. It's meant to be read as a whole unit. It's very difficult to do that because we try to digest little pieces of it, but then we seem to forget about the context and how these pieces fit together. And so there is, this is likely a sermon that somebody preached that was written down because it's so beautiful and so complex, but it all needs to be taken together. So I really encourage you, if you're able to, sit down and read the book of Hebrews, first of all, as a unit. And the entire thing first. Don't think about trying to digest every little piece of it. Just read the whole thing. And then come back and pick through it. Because I think that's how this book is meant to be read. Now with that in mind, I hope that you take the opportunity to download this. But if you don't, I will try to pick us through a little bit of this as we can. Pick and choose a few things. The first thing, let me tell you a big myth. Big myth about... The book of Hebrews. It is, the myth is simply this. It was written by a guy named Paul. Myth! That's a myth. It's just absolutely not true. I know you grew up thinking that it was written by Paul. You've been told that it was written by Paul. Your pastor probably told you it was written by Paul. We can almost tell you for a fact that it was not written by Paul. Why? Because the author of the book of Hebrews, two reasons. Number one, does not claim to be a first-generation Christian who saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not Paul. Paul always claimed to have seen the resurrected Christ to be amongst one of the apostles. This person who wrote the book of Hebrews does not consider him or herself to be an apostle. So we know it could not have been Paul. Not only that, the style of this, the linguistic style, is so radically different than anything that Paul has written. And you're saying, well, come on, people can write in different forms. Oh, no, it's more than different forms. Even a person who tries to emulate some different form or maybe write in a different style still uses the same type of linguistic patterns, the same language, the same vocabulary. This is a radically different vocabulary. This person is a much different person. Now, we don't know who wrote it. Now, I mentioned to you men or women. This may, one theory is, it may be the one book of the Bible that was written by a woman, and the thought process is it might be Phoebe. I think that would be fantastic. I think there's some internal evidence that seems to indicate where the author seems to indicate that, you know, or at least the context of it, that it's a male. Um, there, we can't prove this. I think it would be fantastic if it were Phoebe. That would be great if we actually had a book written by a woman. Pa plausible. Plausible. Unlikely, but plausible. It's as good a guess as any, and it's much better than Paul. We know it wasn't written by Paul. It possibly could have been written by Phoebe. It's like Schrodinger's cat. As long as we don't know what's in the box, whether the cat is dead or alive, it could be either. Well, it certainly could have been written by Phoebe. We don't know. So, um, with that in mind, it is the last book of the Bible to ever be written, or not written, but accepted into the canon of the Scripture. It was, was accepted very late, about 360, around the time the canon of Scripture was coming into being and so forth. And the reason why it was so late is because, again, the author claims that he was not a witness to the resurrection, that he is not an apostle. And that was one of the standards that they wanted for the books that were placed in the Bible. But there was that tradition that had already started that was associated with Paul, and so they put it in. But again, the internal evidence clearly indicates that Paul did not write it. So, with that in mind, let's take a look at this. We're going to look at the first 
uh, chapter in the first uh, few verses of the first chapter and a few first few verses of the second chapter. Now, the reason why we're doing that, and we're not going verse by verse, is because we're reading from the lectionary appointments for Sunday morning, and you will see how they really butchered this lesson. Uh, so we'll try to give you a little good idea with with the lectionary. The problem with the lectionary is that sometimes they they will take passages of scripture out of context, kind of like a lot of pastors do when they preach on them and they try to make them mean something that they don't really mean. So I'm going to try to decompress that and at least put into context uh, what this lesson is supposed to mean outside of the lectionary. So, with that in mind, let's read verses 1 to 3 of the first chapter. And uh, so, so this is, we'll start here, verses 1, 1 to 3. So, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he provided purification for his sins, he sat down on the right hand of majesty in heaven. Um, I, you know, this is just such a fantastic introduction to the book. And it really feels like a creed, right? So it feels like the Apostles' Creed, doesn't it? Uh, when we think about that, you think of all the elements that are contained here that tells us about who Jesus is. It's like the second article of the Creed. If you remember the Apostles' Creed, we've got the first article is about God the Father, the second article about uh, God the Son, third article about God the Holy Spirit. And so this feels like the second article of the Creed that this guy is talking about, whoever this person is, Phoebe or whoever. Okay, so God spoke a word in the past, our forefathers, many times in various ways. God spoke through the prophets, okay? But in these last days, and this is important, last days. Now, I want you to be cautious about this. This is not end of times, Arnold Schwarzenegger's end of days, or whatever the case might be. So I'm asking you not to think of at the end times. This is not what the author is referring to. In these days, in this generation, in this time frame, the author is trying to say. It's not apocalyptic. It's in these days that the world is going through right now. So they would think of things as the uh, present day uh, in which evil was rampant, this present day, latter days, the messianic age, in which God's presence has now crashed into the world. So this is the latter days, I should say, in the time when the messianic prophecies crashed into the world through Jesus Christ. That's what he's referring to. Not the end times when the world comes cataclysmically to the end, which, by the way, is not the view of the Bible. It's just the way of a few people like Christians that want to sell a lot of books. Okay? If we are in the Messianic age, so this is what he's referring to. If we're in the Messianic age, why are things still such a mess? And this is what the author of Hebrews wants to address. The world is still a mess. It looks like the previous days. We're in the, the end day. We're in these, these, uh, these last days where the Messiah has finally come. We're in the Messianic age. Why is the world still such a mess? Isn't the purpose of the Messiah to set everything right? So this is the beginning point of the book of Hebrews. How is the Messiah going to set things right in these, the last days. Okay? So with that in mind, if we are in the Messianic age, that means the blessing is in our presence in Jesus Christ, and we have been blessed with this gift so that we can spread the gift of Jesus Christ to the world. The world, the world needs God's love, after all. Because in these last days, God is bringing about a change in how God now communicates the world. So that's the other thing that he's saying. So first of all, he's telling us that we are living in this messianic age. Secondly, he's telling us the way God communicates to the world has changed as well. 
In the past, God had to speak through the prophets. But now, because we live in the Messianic age, God talks directly to us through Jesus. So things have changed. The world is different. We're in the last days now. I know it doesn't look good. There's still a mess. But first of all, he wants to get us straight about who this Jesus is. Okay, and so he goes on. And uh, in particular, later in verse 2, I'm going to erase this a little bit. He tells us several things about who Jesus is. I mentioned this is kind of like a creed. He talks about his unique relationship with God. Oh, so pay attention to this. It says, one, he's an heir. This is verse two. It says, he's the heir, the one who acquires the inheritance. When the, when the daddy dies, this is the guy who's in charge. Therefore, if you want to deal with God, you deal with the heir. Now, obviously, we, you know, this, kind, this image breaks down at some point. God doesn't die in this way. But uh, the point is the imagery of, of this is the one that we go directly to. If we want to talk to God, we go directly to the heir. The other thing is about creation. And this is kind of the interesting thing. So, he is the power of creation. He's not been created in these last days. He pre-existed everything that's going on. He's always been here. He was, he is, he always will be. Hmm. Okay, three. He says he's the radiance of God's glory. So, you know, um, it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> you know, if, if, if you could, you know, they make these things when, when uh, there's eclipse of a sun and so forth. It's a way that you can look at the sun. You don't ever look at the eclipse of the sun without the special uh, uh, accoutrements that are made for that type of thing. But you can see what? The corona around the sun, the radiance around the sun. So you have the sun there and the corona around that just radiates uh, still the energy of the sun and so forth. So he's saying we may not be able to look directly at the sun, but we can look at the rays that come out from the sun. So it's still a part of the sun, right? <laughs> yes. So he's the radiance of God's glory. Uh, and then four, he also says that he is an exact representation. He's a clone. Okay, I guess you'd say. I don't know. It literally means that he is the impression or the mark, the seal that's made by God upon the world. Okay? And so he sustains the entire world, world and all things with a word. He purifies the world. He is the author. Uh, he is the one who detoxifies the world, who sat down to go on. And, you know, these things are all here. Listen to this again. I want you to hear this. In the last days, he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. So he is the one who's Jesus, this one, this unique one, the Messiah. He hasn't mentioned that name Jesus yet, has he? He's going to. But the Messiah, the one who's, we know, because we're on the, we're on the know, we're on the inside. This one who's the heir, the cre uh, uh, was present creation, the radiance of God's glory, the representation of God. He is the one who sustains the entire world with a simple word. Hmm. We've mentioned this often enough that you know that the only person who with a word can sustain the world and create is God. He purifies the word world. The author uses the word actually catharsis, the Greek word catharsis. It means he detoxifies. He purifies us of sin. And then he sat down in the heavenly places of power. So this is who he's talking about. So we live in the Messianic age. We live in those latter days. We still live in those latter days. 
People say to me, why aren't we living in the end times? We've been living in the latter days since the time of Jesus Christ. I hope we live in these latter days for another 10,000, 10 million years because I think there's some spectacular people yet to be born that God wants to love. How amazing is that? So we live in this time. Now here's the interesting thing. This is where our uh, lectionary gets a little bit dumb. Okay, we skip all the way to chapter 2. And, and, and we start reading verses uh, uh -huh, 7 to 9. So we skip a whole bunch of verses. Now, I encourage you to read those verses. Again, take the handout that I provided for you and read it to see what we're missing. But the way they compress this, it's so odd with the lectionary. So he's talking here about the Messianic Age and the Messiah and what the Messiah has come to do. And we skip ahead... And the way it reads, if you go straight from here to here, it almost seems like he's continuing to talk about Jesus. He's not. Because the author actually skips and talk, talks about you and me. Okay? So listen to this. So we've just been talking about Jesus, and we skipped to verse 7. And you would think that we're talking still about Jesus. This is part of the problem how they butcher sometimes the scripture with the reading of the lectionary. You made him, so I'm going to skip right here. I'm going to, I'm going to go straight from what we are supposed to read in the lectionary. So he's talking about uh, the Son of Man, his reign is a glory and exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. Oh, then we're going to skip to verse 7. You made him a little bit lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. So it sounds like the author is speaking about Jesus. He's not. We need to decomp or comp decompress this a little bit, okay? Who he's talking about is you and me. God made you and me a little bit lower than the angels. You crowned humanity with glory and honor as well, but not the glory and honor of Jesus. Okay, so he's telling us, we're pretty spectacular people. You put everything under his feet. He's quoting again from a passage in Scripture here, Psalm 8. Okay? So the quote is act actually says, uh, <laughs> now what's interesting about it from Psalm 8, uh, the Psalm 8 actually talks about God, not angels, that you are created a little bit lower than God. Okay? So, kind of misquoting the Bible a little bit, but that's kind of what uh, he's quoting from the LXX, which is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, and this is how the Greeks translated it. So, we are slightly lower, but basically what the author is saying is that you and me, we're slightly lower than the heavenly beings, okay? And those in the realm, that we are then crowned with great glory and honor. So this tells us how spectacular a view God has of you and me, okay? What God wants to do, you were made, you, listening at home, were made a little lower than the angels, but God has crowned you with glory and honor. You have glory and honor too. You have been crowned with glory and honor. But then he goes on. And putting everything under his feet, our feet, God has left nothing that is not subject to him. In other words, the entire world is ours. To do as God has placed us here to do. But wait a minute, the world is a mess, right? Remember how I told you in the very first section, we live in the latter days. They thought the latter days meant the Messiah is here, therefore everything should be perfect. Everything is not perfect. The reason why everything isn't perfect is you and me, we're in charge. Okay? We still are in charge. And we've done a pretty crummy job of mastering this universe. We use it for our own selfish purposes. We have glory. We have honor. God has blessed us with this opportunity. We've taken advantage of this and used it for our selfish purposes. That's why the world is still a mess. But then he goes on. But... Verse 9. 
That word but is really important. Now we're transitioning back to Jesus. So we have this little foray. So we start with the Messiah, the Messianic age. He then talks about you and me, how we are still been blessed with honor and glory, but we kind of screwed everything up, right? But now he's back to Jesus again. So back to Jesus. But we see Jesus. But, so things aren't as they, are, they, they sh should be. But we see Jesus. How do we see Jesus? Who was made also a little lower than the angels. So when he lived and walked amongst this earth, he walked in our same condition and status. He willingly subjected himself to become a little bit lower. So remember again what we, are, what we learned about this Messiah the very first time. The Messiah is higher than all things, is the image of God, or is the reflection of God, not just the image of God. You and I are the image of God. He is the exact duplicate of God. Jesus willingly submitted himself and became like us. We're a little bit lower. So now we first all hear the name of Jesus. He was made a little bit lower than the angels, but now he's been crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So the author makes this transition from talking about humanity to talking about Jesus and how we've seen him now. Now the one who is the Messiah who is, has been named. And we are told what it is that he's done. Yes, the world is still a mess, but he had bigger fish to fry. And it has to do with our relationship with God. He restores relationships the way that they are intended to be restored through his death and through his resurrection. He overcame human sin and is now at the rightful place on the throne and is freed us from bondage. This is what the author is trying to tell us. So yeah, the world still doesn't look the way it should. But the most important thing in these latter days was done by Jesus Christ. This messianic age where the Messiah has come to restore us to relationship with God. So this is the author's beginning point. Really a complex argument. I hope it makes some sense to you. I encourage you again, <coughs> between now and the next time <coughs> that we get together, please take the handout that I provided for you. Read the entire book of Hebrews so that when we come back and we start pulling these things out bit by bit, they will make a little bit more sense in how the author is trying to argue. Um, let me leave you again with this hope. Yeah, world's a mess. Got it. We're the ones that did it. However, we have quite a bit of honor and glory that God has placed upon us. God loves us. God's not going to abandon us. And so God has spoken a word, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We now live in the Messianic age. We have hopefulness of restored relationship to one another, and most importantly, to God. We have a direct contact to God through Jesus. And that is indeed good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is such a complex book, and I just don't know how effective I've been in communicating such a, a dense and rich passage of Scripture. And it's absolutely dense and rich. And while we could read this a hundred times and continue to still discover and learn from us. And we thank you for the book of Hebrews because it is probably the most dense and rich book in the entire Bible. And so I'm just hopeful that it will touch the lives of those who read it and that they will be so impressed by the word that you've spoken. They will have comfort and hope in you. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.